Hello everyone, welcome. Once again, my name is Gaina King and I love coming into this group daily and reading about your gratitudes and really reading all the stories. So I want to follow um, this beautiful uh, th uh, method that you're following and, and actually, even though I do it for myself, you know, where you have to actually do it on video and share with people, it just makes it so much more powerful. So uh, obviously the first one I'm going to be thanking is Happiness Aid uh, and, and Happiness Aid Live for uh, giving me this opportunity to come and share some wisdom with you. And specifically, I'd like to thank Priya for being so patient with me this afternoon as this is my first video and first Facebook Live. So um, that's interesting for me. And uh, Yes, yeah, just say hello everyone because really I'm used to interaction but I'm just going to just really enjoy this experience with you. So, fantastic. Um, my second gratitude has to be, this made me laugh today when I thought about it, it has to be to my hairdresser. And the reason being is that um, I'm based in both Perth and Brisbane um, I said, I've got a home in Newstead and a home in Cottesloe, and I normally go between the two. But obviously with COVID at the moment, I'm based here in Perth, but my hairdresser that I tend to use is based in Brisbane. So my fringe was down here and I gave it a cut uh, yesterday. And I'm always kind of thinking, oh, my hair's so straight, it takes five minutes. But obviously with the amount of time I spent um, cutting my fringe yesterday and having to cut it a bit shorter and a bit shorter, <laughs> Yeah, I now have this newfound gratefulness uh, to my hairdresser and I can't wait to see her when I get the opportunity again. In the meantime, I'll just keep at it myself. My third gratitude has to be the ocean. That's why I started with the song. I've got, you know, there's so much magnificence when you're looking at an ocean and you're having a look at the sunset and nature. And I was really feeling that today I was, as I was sitting here waiting to come online. So... Super grateful to be here with you and uh, look forward to us um, enjoying the session together. So, as I said, Gainer King, now my official uh, you know, title that I use sort of in a business sense is I'm an executive coach. And so what does that mean? Because even, you know, these days there's life coaches, there's all different types of coaches and in the, why would I call myself an executive coach? Well, the reason I am an executive coach is because I tend to focus more on corporate clients. It doesn't mean I don't work with people who are not in corporate, but generally um, most of my clients come from, say, you know, all the big firms, all the big banks, um, you know, the very large firms, um, oil and gas companies, those kind of people. And they tend to be sort of, you know, CEOs or next level down. Um, hi, Julie. <laughs> oh, also, Rianda, thank you. Hello, lovely lady. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, uh, in the past, in, in when I've been in uh, my HR, I used to be head of HR for an investment bank. And obviously, I used to coach all levels there and also a lot of graduates. So I do focus on the full spectrum, but most recently, it has been that senior level. But it's interesting because uh, when I left, I had a 25-year corporate career, initially in oil and gas as a commercial negotiator. And then uh, my husband and I moved to Japan for his work. And um, a female negotiator was never going to work in that uh, arena. So I changed to investment banking. And I went to work for a company called Lehman Brothers, which was the one that went bankrupt. So that's, that's a story in itself. We won't go there today. And anyway, um, I ended up, uh, my last role was head of HR. I ended up leaving uh, my corporate job because I felt so burnt out. And I felt very unhappy because at the time that I was there, obviously there was uh, the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the GFC. So even though I had this prestigious role or so, you know, we like to think that we're achievers and or I was head of HR for Asia. How fantastic is that? I was actually miserable because really I was the head of redundancies. 
And so that sort of led to me um, going on a personal journey in terms of looking for growth outside uh, my corporate career to try and work out what I wanted to do next. It ended up that I left um, investment banking and I, while I was still in investment banking, I trained as a coach and I did all the sort of technical training that I needed to be able to coach. And I came out and I was starting to coach, but didn't really enjoy it very much as, as I thought I would. And I, so I decided to take a step back for a little while and I went on my own journey. I did things like, I'm sure many people have heard of him, I did Tony Robbins because uh, someone had recommended it. But as a result of doing Tony Robbins, I ended up going to India and I, someone had said, oh, you know, you'll enjoy India. Just go off to India, you know. So I went off to India and I had a very spiritual journey there and I, I had some real awakenings, um, which I'd never experienced before because I was a very outward focused person. I'm sort of, I was out there to get the outcomes that I was looking for at, in the office, in my relationship. It really wasn't, there wasn't any sort of faith or religion in my life or any kind of spiritual thing. So I was just the kind of person, someone had said, oh, you'll enjoy this. And I'm, I'm sort of someone who really enjoys it. I'm sure there's many people. Let me know if you'll enjoy personal growth. Who doesn't? Um, so I went there and uh, I went on this journey. And, I, you know, you have all sorts of experiences. They put you in meditation practices and you, you have all these wonderful experiences of going to different realms and whatever. And, you know, you get sort of tied up with the experiences that you have. But the most important thing about that journey is when I got home, I started to see that I felt differently. And I started to practice the lessons that I had been taught. And that led me to go... Well, is there a, some kind of way to bring some of these spiritual lessons that are available to all of us? How can I sort of bring it to that corporate world? Because one of the most challenging things when you're in corporate, you go on all these training courses, but you don't change. When we have behavioral issues, we're often aware of our behavioral issues, but we don't know how to change them. So for me, it was, well, actually, I had seen how you change it. And so um, I wanted to try and share that. Now, interesting enough, as you go along this journey and you put together, you know, I'm just keeping it real with you guys. You know, when you put together your, your bio so that clients can decide, um, you know, who to choose um, when they're looking for their executive coach. You know, I've got this bio that's got a great background, you know, oil and gas, negotiator, head of HR, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I often find that when I first meet clients, you know, I say after they've seen the bio and I say, what made you choose me? And often they talk about my background. But in reality, the reason why I chose this job is that when I was in my corporate role, it was all about me. It was all about me achieving and my success. And I just, I felt like a narcissist. I just did not feel like I was really contributed, contributing to the world. And so doing this role, it's so exciting because it's not about me, it's about you. And I get to, to give back some of the wisdom. But if anyone's ever had a really good coach, it's all about them giving you the aha moments. That's what is my favorite, is to see that people have actually, I've asked a question, a probing question, and it's just led them to shine a light on something that they have been struggling with for a while. So in terms of background, that is why I decided to do this. Yes, I've got all that business knowledge. And yes, it helps me when I'm coaching people because I understand what they're going through and I'm able to discuss it. But if you've got a really good coach, they're really listening and helping and probing to help you to get to that outcome that you want. So when I was thinking about this opportunity and, you know, we're focusing on happiness aid and it's like, Often people go to work, they're doing the job so that they can be financially stable and they can provide for the family and all these kind of things, or feeling like you want to achieve, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But there is uh, an element of saying, well, 
I can be happy there too. And there are so many people who are not happy at work. And so, you know, that is why I sort of bring the two together. So as I said, I get chosen for my credentials, but I often love the element of surprise when you're able to get them to open up in a way that they weren't expecting because they weren't expecting you to ask them whether they would consider meditation, etc. And look, I don't push anybody in any direction at all, but it is more around trying to open up their mind to possibilities of looking on the inside rather than everything being an external tool or an external focus. What do I need to do on the inside to transform? So I chose some, I mean, I could pick a million topics, but I tried to pick, you know, with us going through COVID at the moment, and I'm still continuing um, to interact with my clients and, um, you know, meeting them online. And what I've been doing is thinking about what have they been experiencing? Oh, hi, Lisa. That's what I thought I just saw. And... Uh, what we have is four topics I thought that I'd cover today. One is control, you know, focusing on what you do control and what you rather than what you don't control. Shifting the focus from yourself to the other. Um, how do we use observation as a tool to transform yourself? And then I just want to talk a little bit at the end about meditation. So if you have a question as we're going through, I'd love to hear from you. Or if you have a question afterwards, because obviously I know a lot of people, it's a busy time of the day. And so they may watch this later. I will make sure that I come back and, and look at the comments and answer questions and help where I can. OK, so let's start with control versus focusing on what you control versus not what you don't. OK, and... Um, so I like to use two examples. So I'll use a, a, a work example and a personal example because obviously not everyone is um, in the office environment. So when I think about this, you know, often when you're having what I call an inner disturbance, our focus is on what someone else is doing. So a good example in the business sense at the moment, if you have a look at COVID, there's a lot of us who are being impacted financially um, because we can't go to work. And a lot of the major corporates that I'm dealing with, people have been asked to reduce their salary, you know, whether it's 80% or 60%, you know, going down to three days a week. Some people are being asked to reduce salary, but actually still work full time. So there's all, everyone is obviously feeling like, okay, here we are with this financial situation. I'm being asked to reduce my hours and, you know, and we spend a lot of time focusing on why did they do that? Why did they pick me? Blah, 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 all these kind of, kind of things. And what I'm saying is the decision with that or redundancy or, you know, a lot of things that happen, we often, so like, I know that a lot of clients are saying, is this going to now lead to redundancies at work? And so people's anxiety levels start to, to rise. And that's not really what we're looking for. We're all focusing in this group on how do we keep ourselves in a happy and a calm state. So one of the things I say to you, when you start focusing on, am I going to be made redundant? Um, are they going to lower my salary? Is it going to go from lowering my salary to no job at all? When am I going to be able to go to work again? If you think about those questions... You don't control the outcome. You don't know when they're going to say you can go back to work. You don't know whether you're going to go back to full time. And you don't know, you know, what is going to happen. I mean, yes, we're starting to come out of it here in Australia. But the business is going to take a lot longer to recover from this. So if you're focusing on those things that you don't control the outcome, you're actually going to be feeling stressed about it. So, you know, when I think about that, I think, well, what, what can you be doing? You know, if finance is the stressor because you've had reduced time, you know, what I say, well, what do you control? I mean, you control your discretionary spend 
And so, you know, we all should be looking at our budgets and, you know, all the basics, but it's more around giving you the example. I control the money that I do have. I don't control what happens with the job. I control whether I can go and speak to the bank or, you know, various things. So what I'm trying to demonstrate here is focus on what you do control. So in a personal example, so when I was, uh, we, we started with the COVID, I was like, okay, I don't want my stress levels to increase. So, but do I control COVID? Do I control what's going on around me? No, of course I don't. But what do I control? And I really focused on that. And so what I was thinking is, I control how much sleep I get um, and I control, you know, I get up. So, and so what I was thinking is, okay, I, I can't control the external environment, but I can control how I feel about it and how I react to it. So some examples of that. I was thinking, okay, and you know what? It doesn't matter what I'm going to share with you what I have done because I felt that this helps me feel like I gain control in this area. Now, you may go, oh, that, that thing that you're doing really doesn't work, actually. I, I appreciate that you've tried to do it, but it doesn't work. It's not really what it's about. It's about I feel in control as a result of doing it. So my day will start that I get up and I have boiling water with hot lemon because I believe that that gives the immune system a boost and a good, a good flush of the system. I then get into, I'm lucky enough to have an infrared sauna at home and I spend an hour in the sauna detoxing the body and that's apparently supposed to be good for the immune system as well. I then, uh, you know, I leave that, but during, sorry, during the infrared sauna, I have one hour of meditation and it's around calming myself and setting myself up for the day. And then when I come out of it, I have a celery juice and I do fasting and I do all sorts of things. Now, the thing is, what that does, it's, it's irrelevant what your routine is, but you have gained some discipline that you feel that you are at least in control of parts of your life. Whereas if you're spending all your time focusing on when are they going to make me redundant, what is going to happen, um, who are they going to choose first? You don't know the answers to that. And so all that is doing is raising your anxiety levels. So that's what I mean about focus on what you do control, not what you don't. Because when you focus on what you don't control, because you can't come to an outcome for that, then that is when you feel more anxious. Secondly, is there any questions on that? If you have, please, you know, um, let me know. Otherwise, we'll go on to the second topic. Just get a bit more light here now that we're getting a bit more darker here. Second topic is about shifting the focus from ourselves to the other. Now, often when I'm speaking to a client, you know, obviously what happens each time I have a session, the client brings the topic and they say, well, you know, this has been going on for me and, you know, but generally when they're in that story of telling me what has been going on, a lot of focus is around, you know, how they, how things are having an impact on them, quite obviously. So, and then... What happens is that they're living in the story. So uh, let me give you an example. I'll try to think of a really good example. Okay, I've got um, a client in one of the banks. And he said to me, he came and told me a story. He said, look, I'm not getting on with my boss. I said, oh, well, tell me about it. And he said, well, you know, he stopped Casual Friday in the office because one person came to work um, dressed inappropriately. Now we don't have casual Friday for anyone. And he said, I just, I just don't feel very happy about it. It has a real impact on morale. And, um, you know, had to, he could have just talked to that individual and then everybody would have been happy with casual Friday. And I said, and what else? And he said, well, you know, we've got a leadership away day coming up. And he has asked us to dance on stage to show that we're vulnerable. 
happens as well. So when you think about those two stories, excuse me, I just need to sit. You go, fair enough, these are, you know, yeah, you'd be upset with your boss if all of a sudden no one else had casual Friday and, you know, and who really, you know, if you're not comfortable dancing on stage and showing vulnerability in that way, you shouldn't really be forced to do it. But, you know, the story went on for quite some time and then I sort of said, well, you know, what is the real story here? I said, what is the question you don't want me to ask you now? And visibly, you could see his body was changing. And he sat quiet for a couple of minutes. And then he said, oh, my goodness. I said, what is it? And he said, I've been sitting here telling you the story. He said, but really, when you asked me that question, I realized that I'm just unhappy with my boss because I'm unhappy with my bonus. He said, I've had a bumper year and, you know, the bonus just didn't reflect what I was hoping. And so I said to him, well, okay, let's shift the focus from yourself to your boss. Okay, we've established that he's not the evil person that you're saying he is. But let's talk about the bonus. I said, the banking industry has just gone through this huge commission and no one was going to get a good bonus. So can you see the different perspective? Can you see the corporate perspective that this was never going to happen regardless of the year that you had? And this isn't really about you. It's about just how the industry is going. So that's an example I'm trying to say to you is that sometimes when we're suffering or we're hurting or we, we're just feeling angry and frustrated, it's because we make it all about us. And the whole idea is if you can shift the focus to the other and see the other perspective, then actually you will stop to suffer a lot earlier than you, 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 the frustration dissolves. So what happened with that client, you could see visibly he had a change. And then he was calling me every day for a week saying, still like my boss, <laughs> still like my boss, okay? He was waiting to, for the frustration and the anger to come back with his boss. But the reality is when you go beyond the story and shift the focus to the other, it actually dissolves the emotion that you're feeling. And all that requires is you being honest with yourself. Even if he hadn't told me, you know, that that was the truth, he would have made the transformation if he told him that himself. So there's an element of saying shifting the focus. And, you know, I used to use this a lot as a negotiator, is that if I was going into a negotiation, I would spend so much time focusing on what are their needs because I was thinking the only way that you get a win-win deal is if you're really focusing on them. So many of us focus on what we want and spend all the time preparing based on what we want rather than focusing on the other. And so what I would say to you is or shifting the focus from ourselves to the other really is all about um, thinking about the other reduces that emotion or inner disturbance when you have it it reduces it because you're not feeling that uh, that same level of frustration when you understand the truth and a simple thing as well when we're going through COVID um, if I started to uh, sense you know you get that sense and you feel it in your body and it starts to move up that you may be operating from a space of fear then what I tend to do in that case is shift the focus. And what I do is, who needs help? Who of my friends need help? Do I need to help my mother who's in Aberdeen, Scotland at 89 on her own, not wanting to stay inside? Shifting the focus from yourself to the other actually helps you move away from being self-obsessed. We're all obsessed with ourselves and and, you know, it's all about us. And, you know, we always say that, you know, having gratitude and helping others helps you feel better for yourself as well. So that's really what I was wanting to talk about, um, shifting the focus. 
Again, if you have any questions, please let me know. If you're just happy listening, I'll keep on going and uh, we'll move on to the next topic. So when I talk about observation as a tool to transformation, one of the things, because when I'm coaching, people are focused, so external focused, and if they were anything like I was when I was in corporate, I actually didn't recognize or acknowledge that there was an inner world for me. I was operating clearly from the mind. It was all about achieving and, you know, the, the concept of having inner thoughts or that the thoughts were mine. <laughs> I don't know where I was, but I was a very external focused outcomes, delivery, I, you know, I was an achiever, um, but I wasn't recognizing that side of me. And I, I'd say a high percentage of the clients I see are the same. They're very good at their job. And as a result, they're not really spending um, much time looking on the inside. And, and for many, it's a very uncomfortable process. As, as this group knows, when you do the work, it's, it's, it's not meant to be easy all the time, but the outcome is worth it. So what I like to do is that, you know, often when I meet um, with the individual and their boss at the start of the coaching assignment, I ask the boss, you know, what would you like to see the outcome to be? You know, you've encouraged this person and you, you're helping them. Um, by agreeing to pay for their coaching, what would you like to see they do differently at the end? And often we get some, you know, really off the wall um, answers. Because, by the way, my kind of coaching is I'm looking for the gold in you. I've done lots of remedial coaching in the past when you're in banking and it's performance management coaching. That's not really, that's not what I do now. I really am looking to unlock the gold in you so you can be the best and you can get the outcomes that you want. But when you sort of meet them, they're very external focused and the issues that they're dealing with are very external to them. And so, and sometimes those uh, managers are giving them some off the wall feedback, like uh, he's way too structured or, you know, I'd like him to, um, you know, I'd like him to be a little bit, more, you know, <laughs> um, proactive in this section or whatever. And you can see the look of shock on the individual's face. So when, yes, Lorraine, I got distracted because I was reading, yes, we are in an economic driven society, but I believe you can have both. So I'll keep on going. So what, what ends up happening is that I say to the person, they'll say, well, manager said, you're very structured. And he goes afterwards, I'm not structured at all. I don't know what he's talking about. And I'd say, okay, what I want you to do is go and observe yourself for the next month. Every time in a meeting, are you flexible? Are you going with the flow? You know, or just, just observe yourself. Really, that's all I want you to do and jot some things down. Well, he, you know, this individual, he couldn't wait a month. It was a week later and he's going, I can't believe it. I'm incredibly structured. So observation is really good, <coughs> excuse me, as a tool. to observe how you are reacting. So an example would be, um, I remember, uh, Julie, we've all got gold, we've got a lot of gold within us. And, um, you know, there's a, just a sideline there, Julie, there's this great uh, formula, which is called small p equals large p minus i. And the small p stands for performance and the equals, the large p is potential minus the i stands for interferences. Hi, Rebecca. I love using this formula because when I talk to people, I'll say, oh, you're a great performer right now. Do you think that you're reaching your potential? And so... Performance equals potential minus interferences. And then we, I'll say, to them, well, what do you think your interferences are? And so 
what we're doing is we're looking for the gold. So these are holding you back. What can we change within you to stop those holding you back? And a lot of them are internal uh, as well. And some are external, like the systems don't work or I don't have enough resources. You know, there's many things like that. But I think what I'm trying to say is, so when you observe yourself, you're able to see and become aware of some of the things that you weren't aware that you were doing. So um, a great example, and my awareness came way too late. I was already out of the corporate world when I discovered this. I used to go into meetings and... At the time when I was doing negotiations, it was quite a male-dominated environment. And um, I would go into the meeting and I'd have an idea and I'd, you know, express the idea and I wouldn't sort of get any response. And I knew what I was doing because I've been looking at that situation and looking back and observing myself and what I was doing was I didn't get a response. And then five minutes later, one of my male colleagues was going, um, oh, you know, I think we should do this. And I'm thinking, well, didn't I say that five minutes ago? And I'm finding that, A, I'm leaning out because I'm, I'm, I'm annoyed. I'm, I, I'd normally say I'm pissed off. I'm really annoyed. Um, and so what I would do is I'd lean out. And I'd be sitting there and if I was observing myself in that moment, I'd be going, what just happened? WTF? Didn't I say that five minutes ago? Why is he taking my idea? Do they not respect me? Do they not like me? You know, if you, if you listen to, to what you're saying to yourself, it's pretty scary. And it's normally a sign. It's like you're actually disengaging. You're disconnecting. And you're having this whole conversation with yourself about, how can they treat me like this? Uh, doing this because I'm a woman, you know, whatever's going on in your head, okay? But what you should be thinking is that if you're observing that you're doing that, you're also aware that you're disengaging and therefore you're not adding the value that you want to add anyway. And it's just as easy for me to sort of lean forward and going, oh, great idea, that builds upon my idea that I talked about five minutes ago, make a joke about it and keep going. But instead, I lean out, and that's fine. So I leave that meeting, and that's all okay, and I get over it. I feel frustrated, and I, you know, meditate for half an hour, and then, you know, um, I think, okay, I'm feeling better now, until you go into the next meeting. And something else happens that they're not listening to you. And once again, you lean out. And then as you find time goes by, and that happens time and time again, your frustration levels are just getting to anger and anger then all of a sudden you say I hate this job I want to leave I don't like the people I work with they don't respect women whatever there's loads of stories going on in your head whereas <laughs> you know and yes right Julie ob observation you know it, it's just a the reason when you observe yourself in that moment, and so the amount of clients that come back saying this was a fascinating exercise because I didn't realize I was doing that or I did realize I was doing it, but that aspect of when you are having a conversation with yourself and blaming the others and, you know, observing all the things that they're doing wrong instead of what you're doing wrong, you're not part of the game and you're getting frustrated and you're not enjoying your job. So that's an example of where I give clients this observation exercise. And then when they come back with those observations of, you know, then we work on small strategies, um, you know, or, you know, people come home from work and they're irritated when the kids come and run all over them and, hello, daddy, hello, mom, you know, and they said they're feeling exhausted, they've had a bad day and... And, and, you know, I'm like, well, okay, observe yourself in that moment. And then we come up with a strategy that actually he goes upstairs, he has a shower and then comes down and then, you know, he's in the right mindset. But what he's trying to do is say, I think my wife should not have the kids running up to me and saying hello at night like that. I'm just exhausted. I just need some time to myself. 
instead of him going, okay, I need a strategy because I need to be able to shift focus. I need to be able to deal with this and the strategy that, you know, may be one of many, but you know, just an example with the shower. So, but it really starts with you being able to observe yourself. So and I'm not saying you necessarily have to observe yourself in the moment. I think it's probably even more powerful if you can. And I've actually had some clients who have observed themselves in the, in the moment, getting really angry in the, in the um, meeting and not wanting to react. And so they excuse themselves to go to the toilet and they... Um, and, and what they do is they do a bit of breathing exercises, calm themselves down, go back in and re-engage. So there's all sorts of strategies. They sort of are the external strategies. But often what I do is I come to the end of the day and if I haven't managed to go over the day, then I sit quietly and observe and, and, and review the day and, and have a look at, you know, what was I doing in that? Because what I say to people all the time, you can come with all those stories, but I can't change them. I can only help unlock that potential in you for you to change you. Now, what I would say to you is that having gone through the India experience and it was helpful for me to have a bit of help along the way. So I realized that those sort of spiritual processes and the meditation and everything really helped me. And it was something that I, I tried to meditate in the past and I hadn't managed to do that. And, um, but I felt that when you release the traumas and, you know, your stories that you're holding on to, you actually can go in and be super sex successful in your job and feel really happy doing it because I think most of us we get anxious you know if we feel that our um, role is at risk or we're not performing or we're overwhelmed and if we have tools on how to manage that then it helps you navigate. Now I've got some clients at the moment who I've been introducing to meditation and you know sometimes it's a bit scary for me because they are people who have not even considered meditation and often they, um, oh, oh, let's not talk about that spiritual woo stuff, you know, kind of thing. And I, it, it's a gentle encouragement and it generally, I, you know, I have to choose my clients carefully, but generally I say, you know, this might be a tool to help you because meditation for me, I'm sorry, I'm just getting distracted for a second there. Oh my goodness, I can't show you because it would be too hard with all of the <laughs> technology. But that sky is absolutely amazing. So it's red, it's colourful. I just knew it was going to be fabulous tonight. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. So one of the things that's very dear to my heart and... Um, I haven't chosen this topic today because I wanted to come in gentle and maybe there'll be another opportunity for me to talk about it later. The biggest thing I'm trying to do is to connect your mind and your heart. And one of the ways of doing that and accessing the information that you're holding on to that you're not even aware of. And one way to do that is accessing you know, through connecting your heart and your mind. And what we're trying to do is to get you to operate with both instead of just operating from the mind. And when you can operate from the heart and the mind, you actually have the sense of loving life and, and using all your, you know, and, and I've, read, I've got a book that I'm reading at the moment that's also talking about the gut because we all talk about the gut reaction. But in terms of why I'm talking about meditation now, meditation is a great tool for accessing your unconscious mind and your heart. And um, it, therefore, it really can help you to release 
the traumas or the frustrations or the hurt and anger that you have. All these emotional reactions that you're having, um, you know, uh, can often be from past experiences. And I'm all about let's live in the present. And meditation helps you live in the present. Now today I didn't want to go into a lot of detail, but one thing I, I, I observed, I did some training about three years ago on hypnosis. And I don't use it, to be honest. I, I, uh, I really enjoyed the training program, but, you know, I, I'm mainly dealing with corporate. So, and I'm not really interested in stopping people from smoking and everything like that. I'm more around sort of that transformation of your inner, inner being so that you can feel super happy every day. So, but one thing I observed when I was learning to do the hypnosis, having been to India and had all these experiences that were just sort of out of body experiences, some amazing, uh, beautiful experiences of transforming myself. There's this um, same feeling when you're putting someone under hypnosis that there's a dropping in to the unconscious mind. So when you do hypnosis, you can actually see on a client when they're dropping into it. And then, you know, you're accessing information that is in the unconscious mind. The same applies, well, I, from my own experience, from joining the dots, the same happens in meditation. So a lot of people talk to you about, oh, meditation, you know, it's good for calming and, and, and you know, reducing anxiety. Absolutely it is. But from my own experience, it is also a brilliant tool for accessing the unconscious mind and flowering, what they say, flowering of the heart so that actually those things that bothered you or the things that you're holding on to in the past, you manage to let them go and live more in the moment. So that is why I always say give meditation a go. So I'm one person, when I worked for Woodside many years ago, they put it out on this course which um, included meditation and I could not meditate. I was fidgeting. I was really being a pain in the backside because I was giggling through it. I really must have been so annoying. And so I understand that often meditation can be a timing thing and also it comes about to what resonates with you. So obviously... Um, you know, what I might do um, afterwards if, if someone is interested is just some of the ones that I found. And to, to share with you, um, when the pandemic hit, um, as, as you all know, Facebook has been full of amazing free stuff um, that you could follow. And so one of the things that I was very grateful for is coming across... Um, these two singers called uh, Deva Pramal and Mitten. I don't know if anyone has been seeing what they do, but they've been doing meditations daily. And it's the first time I've done one where there's a bit of singing involved and singing along. And they, they're just two people. They're, they're actually musicians and, and they're also, um, they, they spent quite a lot of time in an ashram. And so what they do is they do a mantra every day and they do some singing. And I think we're on day 56 and I've joined every single day um, to their free meditation. And I've had some amazing transformations and with some things that I've been holding on to, I've managed to transform them, form them. So one of the things I would say to you, sometimes if you've tried meditation and it hasn't worked, I know lots of people talk about the Calm app and all different apps that they've tried and some people like them and some people don't. It's all about looking for the meditation style that you enjoy. So I never thought I would enjoy the singing mantra meditation, it, but it's beautiful. I'm really enjoying it. Another one that um, I've experienced, I've done a week-long course with a guy called Dr. Joe Dispenza. I'm sure many of you know him. And that was transforming to go to his week-long course. Most people go to him with health issues, but I just had so many transformations as well. It was just amazing. And he came out with a free meditation during this time, which was all about love, you know. So, and then there was, um, I, I, with the people that I trained with in India, I will, Julie, I will share the links of the various people there because there's some different ones and they're all very different. 
And when I was in India, I used to do this one, and I still do it, and I used to do it online. I don't do it anymore. Um, it's one called the Soul Sync Meditation. And what I like about the Soul Sync Meditation that I've done is that it's very clear with the steps you need to take. And so, therefore, you're really focused on what you're doing, which helps you not be distracted, um, you know, uh, when you're not distracted by the way, sorry, I'm distracted now. What I wanted to say to you is people think we shouldn't have thoughts. That's not true. You should become aware of your thoughts because it's not possible to not have any thoughts. Be aware of your thoughts and then let them pass. And so what, uh, what I was um, wanting to say to you is that when you are in the meditative space, this is all about expansion. And so with the soul sync, it helps you really focus on the steps which help you get and drop into that unconscious mind. So I know lots of people use it for anxiety and stress levels and, you know, um, and, and that's great. But I'm saying you can actually take it further if you find the right meditations to suit you. So if you're someone who's tried meditation and it really hasn't worked for you, then just look for something else and see what else um, you can find out there. And there's plenty out there that you, it doesn't have to cost you any money. And yes, Julie, I will. Um, and, and I agree with you, Marie. It's all about resonating voice. So some people get Dr. Joe on and they go, he's too loud. And then some people, you know, don't like certain accents. And I, I'm really in the same camp with you with that. So I'm not assuming that what's worked for me will work for you. But I'm saying it's all about just trying to find ones that are going to help you drop into that, that space, that transformation space. And so I really don't know how long I've been going. But yep, that's 45 minutes. So... Next steps from here, if you if you, if this resonated with you or anything, just and you you have a question, just you know, message me or put a question in the box. I'm happy to answer. This was all about helping others today and hoping that if if there's a little nugget of gold in there for you, um, that maybe something here resonates with you and will you know give you joy and 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 really give you the courage to. Go and have a look at some of those things. Are you being controlling? Are you shifting the focus enough? How about using that observation tool? It's a fantastic game to play with yourself. And if you haven't yet managed to crack meditation, give it another go. So thank you, everybody. It's been great being with you. It's been a bit strange not having, you know, chatting and everything. But, um, you know, it's all new experiences for which I'm very grateful. See you next time. Mwah. Bye.